This episode was brought to you by Metallic Dice Games, your source for premium, snazzy-looking gaming dice. Get 10% off dice and dice accessories on MetallicDiceGames.com with our code TRIALS10. They have a bunch of gemstone, plastic, and metal dice, tons of variety, tons of beautiful stuff. Go check it out, and again, don't forget to use code TRIALS10 to get 10% off. Welcome to Conversations and Catapults. I'm your host, Nathan, and today I'm joined by four Drowned Warlocks. Say hello, Drowned Warlocks. Hello, I am a Drowned Warlock. I'm called Ben now. Jesus Christ. <laughs> now? Are yes, before? that was not my previous name. This is my Warlock name. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Oh, uh, help! I don't know how to swim! It's me, the drowned Carla! Nice to meet ya! <laughs> Dear audience, don't be rude. That was method acting. <laughs> Hello! My name is Shredder. I am drowned. Oh my god. Wow. Is that just your mouth? Yeah. That was pretty good. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was, that was really, really good. impressive. I'm, I'm impressed by Sarah committing to like having a glass of water up to their mouth and speaking while it, like, it was filling their mouth. And then <laughs> Sam basically evoking the exact same thing just with their mouth on its own. It's pretty incredible. I can also make <laughs> pig noises and that's about as far as my skills go. We are... Well, that'll uh, have to be for next uh, scene. Absolutely. Next time we go back to the farm. <laughs> yes, <all right. laughs> Welcome for piggies. Hello, little piggies. <laughs> I'm the wolf. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan. Nope, I'm not going to make that joke. And I'm confused. Got it. All right. Easy question to start us off here. Mm. Because, you know, this arc is called the ousting of Bailey Blue. He is at the heart of everything in this whole arc. My question is... Where we are, we're, it feels like we are leading up to a climax of sorts. How do you all, as players, currently feel about Bailey Blue? Like, what is the general... Like, I'm doing a vibe check here. Mm. Because he used to be a one-note, like, annoyance. And <laughs> now, he has quickly become one of my favorite villains. <laughs> and I'm not trying to, like, you know, sway you any which way. I'm just, like, taking a little temperature check to see where you all are at. When we first met Bailey, a very annoying character. Now, still an annoying character. A genuine threat that, uh, it's, I don't know, Serenith is very on the fence of, like, obviously, like, we don't want anyone else to die. But, like, if, if, you know, it's not gonna, she's not a good, she's not a, she's not a good person with this. <laughs> oh, I don't care about what's... I have, I have, like, I'm going to ask about Serenaf later. I'm asking about, like, how do you, Sam, think about this fictional oh. character? Like, yeah. I was... <sighs> same first reaction, just kind of like a very annoying character. I'm entertained very much by what's happening, because it kind of feels like one of those things of, like, but look at, like, this tortured person, and look, like, yeah, but, like, also, you kind of brought this on yourself, but also, it's very, like, complicated, because, like, you're annoying... I want to help you, but like, don't talk to me after we, after we save you. That's all I ask of you. Yeah. Yeah. I think Bailey is, I mean, still obviously a, a, p a piece of mm -hmm. shit, but I think he's a piece of shit in a much more interesting and deep way than we previously saw. It makes me really curious to see how long has this relationship with Our Lady of the Deep slash Henrietta been going on? Was it election stuff that initially encouraged him to pursue this? Or was this a relationship that was happening beforehand? Mm. As I suspect it may have been, what with the Oblex and everything, but I don't know for sure. I find that the more we learn about Bailey, the more I enjoy seeing him. Mm. You'd love to hate I still can't shake off the fact that he is still Bailey Blue, the annoying character that followed us in that one <laughs> initial encounter. To me, he's still that same annoying Bailey Blue, but now he actually just scares me. 
The man is in possession of a lot of power now, like actual, like physical power, and it is it does not bode well. So it's a very mixed combination because as much as I like the direction that this is going, I also don't like the direction that it's going because it spells <laughs> doom for us. A hundred percent. I definitely feel like my perception of Bailey Blue as Carla has definitely evolved from that annoying, I guess like it, from that annoying person, but someone who's like more well-rounded, it adds more information about this person. And I guess like coming from the perspective of someone who plays an integrity and integrity idol, very <laughs> <laughs> that has made bad decisions and have played played with this kind of thing. It definitely makes me like him a lot. I really like Bailey Blue as a character. Yeah. I was going to say, like, he's given a lot for, like, a scrap of power. Like, the most meager little scrap of power. He's given up so much. And it's so interesting to see, like, where everyone falls on, like, the pity to disdain scale. It feels like we're watching a tragedy play. Yeah. Like, this mm -hmm. person's hubris is going to destroy them. And we're just, we ha we're watching it happen, basically. We're kind of complacent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. Yeah? You think so? I mean, maybe a little bit. Mm. like complacent in what way yeah Ma like complacent as in like we just ignored bailey to the point where this may have gone differently if we actually like i don't know had more interactions with bailey like maybe mm, maybe if we encountered Bailey in like a different way and not like the annoying sewer rat that he was that first time. <laughs> if we just sort of like encountered him in like an actual like club thing, maybe the dynamic could have launched off differently. Mm. We still saved his life that first we did. time. Yeah. yeah. But we didn't see any like, the few times that we've hung out with Bailey, I, I say like, but, like the times that we like walked in on him in a room and convinced him to be like this was my idea I'm, I'm a i'm a brilliant person or whatever i think that also kind of shows the kind of a comedic side of like you think you're hot shit but like you've just been easily told what to do by a bunch of like first years at that time and all we had to do was say oh it's your idea and you're brilliant like yeah, he's he's literally a joke. Why would we have any reason to like take him seriously? <laughs> exactly. And now, and now we have to take him seriously. We have to take him seriously because <laughs> exactly. it's too late to do anything else about it. Yeah. Imagine mm. if this whole power trip is literally just because of swim. Just because I, like I like because that. Mira said, fuck you, I want to beat you in an election. <laughs> imagine yeah, this is imagine an alternate world where Mira did not want to be like the president of the planning committee and none of this happened. Like That'd be wild. Like I don't know. I I think this is his excuse for making a power grab. Like the election mm -hmm. is the reason why he is wanting this power, mm -hmm. but that to me is an excuse if that makes any sense. Okay. Like he yeah. is seeking out power no matter what. Mm -hmm. It is not this specific context. Like there would have been a different excuse had the election not been happening. If if the election hadn't been happening, then it could have been like, "Oh, our lady of the deep, I really want to become i really want to join the henrietta or the hedrick society of excellence Ooh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, or i really want to like become number one in the exam placement mm. all of these things that are like these status mm. indicators to bailey who is this nouveau riche kind of like you know takes himself very seriously and doesn't have a wider degree of respect from people like people think that he's good at his job but they don't like him no one who we've seen has anything good to say about Bailey. Even Jackoff, his closest like companion seems to be more bound by duty rather than affection. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry, Bailey. I'm not, I'm not. Hey, die. <laughs> Damn. There we are. There, there's that pity to disdain <laughs> scale that I was talking there about. There are earlier. two people. Yeah. <laughs> it's literally two, two versus two on like a seesaw and it's just sitting in the middle. Speaking of like where your actual characters fall on that scale, though, Sam, you mentioned you were like <laughs> getting into how Serenup felt about Bailey, and and I like told you to hold off because here's where like that comes in. In this set of like three episodes, Serenup is out for blood more for Bailey than she has been for like previous antagonists. I feel like 
and correct me if I'm wrong, Sarenath has always been a bit more of a peacemaker. Even with like these giant ink kaiju mm. you all were facing in Troil, Sarenath was the one who was like, I'm going to find a way to like interact with them peacefully and find a nonviolent solution. With Bailey, it is, and this is partially, I think, a player thing of like wanting to be active and like, you know, going out to do something. Like Mira gave you the option of like, do we go back to check on our friends or like, do we care about our friends or do we chase down Bailey? And you're like, we're going to get this motherfucker. I don't know if those were your exact words, but it was that. I think kind I said the word motherfucker in there. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you absolutely did. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Someone play the tape back, like insert it in here. Uh, ben, that should be a problem, right? A piece of shit. There that, we go. There it is. She, uh, Sarah Neff called him a All piece right. of shit. There we go. <laughs> How did you get that, Sarah? Like, do you just have... I just it was remember. either a piece of shit or motherfucker, because both of them have, have, like, a nice, like, power in the words, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, like, what is different about him compared to other opponents? Or, like, alternatively, what is different about Sarah currently than she has been previously? I feel like, because you were specifying the tattoos there, I think with that, what was happening was that, because in a weird sense, the tattoos were a part of us. It felt weird mm. to destroy something that was a part of us. So me not really knowing like like certain in annotations to words, but like when Luke said playful with the fox, I was like, oh, playful. Foxes are playful. Let's do that as a solution. Like it wasn't until after where we talked about it where I was like, I did not. There was no connection with those with another word. I think I think one of his things was like a lion playing with its food. And I was like, I did not make a connection of any way in that. I am sorry. Whoops. Ah, uh, I gotcha. Yeah. So like with though, with like the tattoos, it was like, they're a part of us. I see them more as mischief makers than anything else. I think just because we didn't see, I don't think, I don't remember if we saw anyone like proper die or at least Sarenip didn't see someone proper die because of it. Mm hmm. I think the whole thing with Bailey is just the moment we met him, he just rubbed Sarah up the wrong way. Just the way he acted just all of the time. Like when we were in, when we were, I think when we were down in the tunnels, I was, me and Integrity were like, we have to like, I want to get away from this guy so badly right now. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and then like, every time we've met him, he just always left a very sour taste. And the fact that then he hurt the society and my friends at the same time is a moment of like, okay, I knew something was wrong. And I, and it, it was like a weird moment of like all of it built up into one moment of I'm going to, I'm going to do something about this guy. Like, I don't know what it is quite yet. I'm feeling the anger. It's going to happen though. <laughs> do you think Bailey in a way might remind Sarah of that system that she grew up with? Ooh. Like the arrogance mm. around him, the unfailing urge to like not only throw other people under the bus but get away with everything all the time and be better that was literally part of the bad taste in my mouth when we first met him and like the fact that i think that the fact that like sarah has been tossed has like run away from that like got tossed out as well mm. it's come back as like a, this is like my way of a weird like defeating my past if i just mm. get this guy and bailey just keeps failing up like yeah. I can imagine Sarah Neff being like, what what the fuck? Like, like, what is this? This very, this personification of all of the shit that you are now separate from. Yeah, and it's just like a moment of like, I have to defeat my demons. And oh, look, there's personified right over here. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have fisticuffs. There is something like very vindicating about being annoyed by someone who hasn't necessarily done any harm, but, but like just is kind of vaguely <laughs> shitty. And then suddenly it's like, oh, you're doing actual bad things now. Like, I, I'm justified in this hatred for Vindicated. You. I, yeah, it's like, oh! It's like when you and your friends find out you all don't like this one person and we're all like, oh, yes. You don't like that person too? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. We need to talk <laughs> about this. I thought it was this. the only one. It's not like you become better friends for it, but it's like a, a whole new energy has suddenly been placed into something and you're just like, we need to... We mm -hmm. need to do something yeah. about this. Like, this energy is yeah. now here. It's honestly incredible that you mentioned... That is such a good way of, like... Yeah, you nailed it, I think. <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, it's not all fun in games, though. Not that, like, hating someone or having active disdain for them is fun in games. 
Sarah, I wanted to briefly switch over and talk to you about Mira, who had a great, yeah. like, standout moment with Professor Doss, who is like, you know, once she came back and like had the had like these shared memories of others in the network, Mira was like unflinchingly honest about so much mm-hmm. with her. Like, is she even a concern for you at this point? Like, what was that born from? I think the only real worry about what Professor Doss could possibly do to Mira is like attempt to modify her memory in some way to remove any memory of the Hedrick Society. Other than that, I mean, I've talked on here before about how Mira has been dealing with this conflict of feeling like there are all of these powerful beings who want Mira to do things for them and feeling powerless in the wake of that and how a lot of this now is starting to break free from that and realizing like how powerful she actually is, what to prioritize. And... I think that one of the things Mira has very much realized is she is not at any immediate risk of expulsion. I mean, the the entire group of SWIM was up against that tribunal about whether or not they should be expelled from school after the artist stuff, and they voted no. Ala Algrim, who is incredibly powerful, has a vested interest in Mira staying at school, so... During the meeting with Crow, that wasn't even really raised. And then Doss, in particular, for one, she's not going to go to Crow because she hates Crow. And two, she also has a vested interest in the Hedrick Society remaining secret. If she reports this to anyone and says, what did Mira do? Oh, she snuck into the secret society. She's putting the Hedrick Society at risk. So there is nothing that Professor Doss, in Mira's eyes, can really do to her. So yeah, Mira has no need to, you know run around and go, what? Me? I didn't break into anything. What are you talking about? (laughs) She's able to say, yeah, I did. What are you going to do about it? Is there any concern about Doss using this information, like, not necessarily against Mira, but to gain a more advantageous position or, like, using it to her own end somehow? Or is that, like, one of those Mm. things that, like, we don't know what the orbs fucking do, and I doubt that you would either. (laughs) I think it is closer to that. Also, Mira doesn't know anything about Professor Doss, mm. like, other than the fact that, you know, she, she is a teacher who seems to care a lot about the school as an academic institution. You know, getting upset, not only that she didn't get this headmaster job, but also about the fact that it was given to this, like, you know, 26-year-old who's just really, really rich. So I, I don't think that Mira views Doss as a potential threat with regards to orb stuff, at least not right now. Although, depending on what she does with, you know, other people even possibly being connected to some of Mira's memories, that may change. Absolutely. Ben, I wanted to talk to you. You know, Winsler, one second, let me think about like a good segue here. Doss <laughs> loves Winsler. Speaking of Winsler. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Winsler. There was a really dark moment in 197 where Winsler had to do a mercy killing. <laughs> yep, he, he certainly does a lot of killing, but at least this was a mercy killing. <laughs> yeah, that's a really difficult situation with the brain of Merrick Beardless. And like, how, how did that affect him, if at all? Is this going to change the way you play Winsler moving forward? Just because even if it is this kind of thing where you rationally know that it is justified you're still the one holding the hammer, as it were, in order to, like, end an innocent life. Winsler is definitely more aligned towards, like, preserving the lives of people who are, like, in trouble and in danger. Seeing, like, just a floating brain having been in prison for, like, years and years, having so much of their, like, life and time stolen away. Winsler probably was, like, even I was thinking, like, can we give this guy like another chance? Like, can we can we do something to like give him like j- even just like a fragment of what you know he had lost? But like, that's not what they wanted. So Windsor probably knew that like even if the effort was put into like you know somehow get this get this brain and like a, a body of its own and like enjoy life for the remainder of however long. That's not what it wanted. It it didn't want that. And yeah, even if you did that, like everyone it knew, everyone Merrick knew is probably gone. It would be a true start from scratch thing, except you have all of these memories of a previous life. The more I think about it, the more horrible that existence seems to me and the more like justified Winsler seems. But also Winsler has been through a lot and I'm interested to see how this affects his morality going forward, you know? 
he's still pretty naive despite everything that's like you know happened to him and swim i think his like nature like on the surface sort of is sort of like it's almost like a cover or like a curtain that's like he wants to this is like what he wants to be like on the outside but maybe on the inside there's something like much darker that like it's just been like growing or something it's not it's not Mm -hmm. good he tries to hide it as much as he can because he doesn't want to feel bad he doesn't want to feel like you know he doesn't want to feel like he's done terrible things and like he doesn't want to feel wrong right do you think he thinks about uh amika a lot or at all probably probably mostly when it's like sort of like a dreaming thing like you're sleeping and like your mind just kind of wanders into like the various different like consciousness that you have just like buried there. Like this mercy killing probably brought back a lot of the moments where he took the lives of people, whether it was justified or not. The fact that he did weighs heavily on him, but he doesn't want to really show it much because he knows that if he does, he probably won't be the same Winslow that everybody knows, which is what he's afraid of. Yeah. And there's also, like, you mentioned that, like, darker side, but we've also seen this, like, righteous anger that Winsler has for a lot of things. Do you think that's now going to be really directed at Our Lady of the Deep, at Henrietta, for doing this, for putting him in this situation? I can see, I can see some of that being directed at her. There's a Mm. lot of people that Winsler knows that could deserve to, you know, have some, like, you know, righteous anger directed at them, like Crow, especially. Or Bailey. Or Bailey, yeah. Bailey more so just because I think Bailey's just more sort of like a, a main enemy to the rest of Swim. They never, like, Bailey and Windsor are just kind of like, whatever. They don't really have much connection to each other. It's more about just being on opposing teams. Yeah. But now, but now that it's like, it's more personal, yeah, there would be some, some fragments of that. I think, I think he would direct a lot of that righteous anger to the Lady of the Deep just because... The Lady of the Deep is one of the founders. Why would you make a school just for it to be your own personal, like, facility full of lab rats? Yeah, no kidding. Speaking of things getting more personal, Carla, I wanted to talk to you about integrity and also, like, gauge the room here because integrity has had a really important moment when you all were leaving Our Lady of the Deep's lair where... She stopped, and she watched Bailey become a warlock. And now, Integrity has a certain obligation to Bailey, doesn't she? Like, despite the fact that he has everything that is important to her, outside of her, like, friends, outside of, like, her loved ones, all of her precious objects are now in his possession, or in Mm. Our Lady of the Deep's possession. So, like, what is her priority when it comes to dealing with Bailey Blue? Priority is... uh such a wonderful word i can definitely say that currently integrity feels like which is also what i wanted to convey in that scene is that she is pulled into different directions here she's greedy she's a greedy bitch and she wants those (laughs) items Mm -hmm. but then she also has that obligation to help warlocks out right and be the keepsy that keepsy cannot be Mm-hmm. And also just being a, like a normal person and helping out her friend to win the election and also obviously to keep everyone safe. So when it comes to priority, I don't I, I can't think of what's the most important thing that, oh, this is what I'm going to pursue next because all of these are equally important to her. Like she's loyal to All of these things. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point she would rely on what's like the most opportune, like opportunistic thing out there. Like, yeah, like the decision is being made for her based on what happens and when, right? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that integrity is the kind of person who would try to seek out these things. But considering the the myriad of things that she has to deal with in this arc and just understanding the gravity of every single thing that's happening, the orbs being in the hands of the wrong people, 
this J dagger that is like insta kills people if if they have a heart being in the hands of a person like Bailey Blue and also being a warlock. So I don't know what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that there is no priority. Whatever integrity feels like is happening in the moment, like she makes decisions by the progression of things. Mm. And I think that's like the the best thing for her to do. Yeah. Integrity runs on instinct, and I don't think that's a wrong way to live, necessarily. Like, because her instincts, you know, she lives and dies by that, right? When has it ever done her wrong? (laughs) (laughs) Never. Mm. I actually, I want to open up the question to everyone else, like, with regards to, like, this episode has had a, or these set of episodes, rather, have had a lot of dominoes being set up. What are your characters' priorities going into, like, the symposium, going into what's next? What is the plan? What are your priorities? Mir's very lucky right now in the sense that her priority of trying to protect the school and keep Bailey from harming everyone and also winning the election happened to line up right here. You know, she's able to do this debate also as a way of keeping track of where Bailey is. I think consciously she is prioritizing like protecting everybody over winning the debate and like beating him. However, when it really comes down to it, we will see how that actually works out in practice. She may make a more selfish choice or perhaps a more vindictive choice in a moment of weakness. Mm. Ben, Sam, what about y'all? How, I, if I must ask, please how do. How in Bested is like Mira here. Are you putting like your entire like is Mira putting her entire please no please soul? no <laughs> her entire soul <laughs> thank you putting your entire one uh, please not not in, CNC, not in CNC not in CNC I already said it Sarah I said spirit I said soul of course of course go on. <laughs> Like, like, is she putting her entire soul into this? Oh, yeah. Mira feels very strongly. I think that the thing is that beating Bailey, with regards to the election, beating Bailey at the election really is primary to winning it. She would be happiest if she won. But, like, if Syndra beat Bailey and Bailey lost, that would be at least, it would not be as devastating as Bailey winning. I, I think that it's very personal for Mira, you know. <laughs> Bailey, not only, like, was it really shitty to watch Bailey, like, cause the problem with the Oblex and then for all of Swim to be punished for it while Bailey got off completely scot-free, for Bailey to, like, constantly show up at, you know, Mira's golem party, for example, to prevent her plans when she was doing the Autumn's End Festival stuff to, like, assign her to take over these, like, angry vendors just because Bailey didn't want to do it. It is a very personal grudge and... To be totally honest, even if Bailey was not involved in evil Our Lady of the Deep stuff, it would be just as personal. So essentially, mm-hmm. it's less about Mira winning <laughs> and more about Bailey losing. Uh, we yes. don't like Bailey. <laughs> yeah. Bailey also, one fucked. side note, just a little side thing. You, Nathan, were like, oh yeah, this moment in the pool with Our Lady of the Deep is where Bailey actually became a warlock. He wasn't one before. If that is true, do we think that the birds going BB, 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 when they name warlocks, may in fact not have been referring to Bailey. I'm just saying I've got my fucking eye on I Bowen. think they were just saying <laughs> beep beep because they're birds and they just had a fun, goofy time there. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely <laughs> that. There's actually a car like somewhere <laughs> and they were emanating like people honking. They're like, what, like mm. are, is it Mockingjays, the ones that emulate, or there's like a bird that emulates like construction noises? Those are from the Hunger Games. <laughs> Those were made up for the Hunger Games. What the fuck is the actual bird then? I don't remember anymore. A mockingbird? That's Are you thinking word. about a parrot? No, there's like a bird that it's there's a like a bird, bird in the wild that like emulates construction noises. I've seen videos about it. It's really interesting oh, to watch. Yeah. Alright, we need to stop and like, figure this, this out why... right now. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, you're all good. <laughs> no, I personally think the crows are unstuck from time and mm. you know, they just knew that Bailey was going to become a warlock naturally i think that's the most Mm. obvious solution because if that's the case nathan that will put the blame on integrity so that's not the answer (laughs) (laughs) i mean like 
just I was just thinking about Carla's thing of like, well, like yeah, we can't blame integrity for this. And I was like, and I was about to say, yeah, how many BB names do we actually know? And I was like, wait, actually, the list is kind of small. Never mind. Bailey and Bowen, yeah. I think. Mm-hmm. But I don't think we know enough people to know all the BBs. Mm. Probably not. Mm-hmm. It's an unrelated BB. It was like a fifth year. They go to a different school. <laughs> ben, I, w- I was asking about priorities, though, to loop us back to the original question. What are Winsler's priorities as like we head into the symposium as like he has escaped from Our Lady of the Deep's clutches? What's his plan? Hmm. What does he care about the most right now? I think the priorities are making sure that everybody will be safe, keep everyone away from harm as much, like minimize the damage as possible. Try and yeah, even fix the shields. whole like like the whole network thing as like even as temporary as it is right now. And one of the steps that will ensure the protection is through Bailey because Bailey right now is the primary like focus because they are a pawn of the Lady of the Deep. Therefore, they are the one who has the most agency right now as opposed mm-hmm. to the Lady of the Deep who is just sitting in her little fish tank looking at all this people's thoughts and stuff. This, this is the real danger for now. We will have to figure out something for the Lady of the Deep eventually, but right now, making sure that this symposium goes relatively smoothly and smoothly and not horrible is mm-hmm. probably ideal. Mm. I mean, this may be an odd question, but it's something that just struck me, which is like, is there any concern over Yogg's safety specifically as like they sign on with Syndra's campaign? Like, do you think that puts a target on their back at all? Or do you think everyone has a target no matter who they are? I think everyone has a target no matter who they are. Mm. I think I That's think fair. it is good that Yogg made like a friend with Syndra because I feel like they're just the perfect sort of duo personally. Yeah. I I don't I don't think Syndra would steer Yogg the wrong way. Absolutely. And I think this is a I think this is an important step for Yogg in sort of continuing to develop their own personality and thoughts and like, you know, their choices and stuff. They need to they need to rely less on Winsler now and more on, you know, going out there themselves and like Create, curating their own experiences. Yeah, like making making their, making, own making their own connections with the world and, you know, seeing it through their own lens. Child's grown and up. And not only that, they're also, Thank they're given a great opportunity here to, like, be a voice for golems, more or less, because, like, it seems to me that Syndra is using uh, Yogg as, like, almost a sensitivity consultant uh, or something of that nature, where it's like, hey, I don't want to speak to what it is like to be a golem or what you all want and need. You are going to be, you're the only person who I can ask about this. So that's a lot of responsibility to give to who is essentially an infant, a newborn. I'm, I'm really excited to see how that develops. But, you know, we have to get to the symposium to see that. And Sarah, you hinted at this a little bit when you were talking about your priorities. I wanted to know if the recent events have changed Mira's strategy for the symposium at all. Like, her talking points before the HSC debacle were probably very different than what they are now if she is going to be using that like same sort of unflinching honesty that we saw with Professor Doss. Yeah, depending on the way the debate goes, and it, Bailey fucking smirking before he goes up to debate her might indicate he has something up his sleeve. It is very possible, especially with the don't trust Mira Marchand like, attack ad culture, that she might directly try to call him out for the Oblex stuff. Mm-hmm. Ooh. But I also recognize that the majority of the student body, like, don't know anything about the HSE. They probably don't know anything about, you know, anything going on in this school. This is a regular school to them. So she does also have to keep this veneer of, like, I'm just good at planning stuff. I am just going to plan good parties and stuff. It has to be a a healthy balance that will not only establish Mira's credibility and also not wanting to look like somebody, you know, making baseless accusations and a desperate ploy to win while also harming Bailey's. It's going to be a delicate balance to thread, especially given what he might have up his sleeve, but we're going to be doing our best. Right. And, you know, he potentially has Efrosini, maybe not on his side, but like unconsciously a pawn for Our Lady of the Deep, given that she was one of the people who was released from the HSC. Mm -hmm. I'm worried. And like her moderating the debate Mm -hmm. with that ace in the hole, maybe. Something to think about. Tough to work around. I'm so excited to see what that is. But before we can get to the symposium, of course, 
there's a very important thing that we have to take care of, which is in this batch of episodes, we had some new characters introduced uh, or we got to see a little bit more <gasps> screen time with them. That's what? right. You know it. I'm talking about the two briny brains, <laughs> Merrick Beardless and Henrietta Hedrick, who is alive and well. I wanted to check and see, you know, we got to we got to find some ships for these two disembodied heads or mm. not heads they're just the brains they're just they the don't brains. even have the skin and skulls yeah mm-hmm. are so. we choosing either or or yeah you can choose yeah, either can choose one either to make a ship okay. with yeah okay what personality traits we know about merrick despondent you know has been dead longer than he's been alive full of despair <laughs> full of despair sad yeah he beardless beardless, beardless. <laughs> <laughs> he has a beard I just um, imagine like he had a beard. Have you ever watched those videos of like the owner of like the axolotls like drawing a drawing a beard on the tank when you the axolotl draw just a face on Merrick's <laughs> we brain? Can dr- we can Poor draw. Merrick. No, no, not on the brain, but like on the glass of like the tank. Like on the glass of yeah, where the brain. Yeah, because we can oh give my. yeah, we can give him a beard. It'll be great. Put Let googly eyes on it, I guess. <laughs> Thinking <laughs> with my little human brain. I know. I know exactly the battleship that I want to do. I'm worried. I wish to battleship Merrick the Beardless with Artis Artesian. God damn it. Why? Why? Jesus Christ. They're both so depressing. And I feel (laughs) like they would both bond over the shared experience of having like this out of body feeling. Oh. (laughs) Ha ha ha. Like, hmm, how does it feel to just only be a floating brain in, a, in like, this weird liquid? Hmm, how does it feel to be just a soul in a pebble? I don't know. It seems pretty weird, yes. right? That's... And with both of them, they've out-aged all of their True. loved ones. True! They can bond over that. So yes. They would be perfect together to bond over their loneliness and depression. <laughs> Well, truly, the a good bedrock for any romantic relationship. Trauma. <laughs> Dang. Jesus Christ. It's great in books. I don't know. Like, listen, yeah. this is fiction. It's fine. I think opposites attract is the rule. Mm. Oh? Ooh. Oh, no, I don't have Do one. Have- I was oh. just like... <laughs> <laughs> that was such a good, like, beginning okay. that you didn't have It was, end. too. Right? I was so ready for you okay, to hit me. Okay, I, with- oh, I have one. Let's hear it. It is Henrietta slash Our Lady of the Deep X Loud. Wow. Um, oh. Mainly because... Okay, imagine this dynamic of both of them, like, dating each other while secretly, like, cackling to themselves, scheming, thinking that they have the other one totally tricked. They're like, haha, they don't know that I'm planning on, like, beating them and consuming them because Loud wants to become a, uh, a more powerful slad. Henrietta just wants all of the power and all of the knowledge in the world. Plus, just the specifics of their relationship can work out. Loud's a frog. He's amphibious. He can swim around in her water. <laughs> tickle her brain yeah, i don't know and that, if there are <laughs> other slods who loud wants to eat henrietta can be a very useful ally in you know summoning a bunch of rats to come bring them around i think they will be very useful for each other's plans until they inevitably betray one another okay i just yeah, have something key. quick that i want to bounce off back at that first point mm. if they're trying to outdo one another how does how does like a surprise birthday party work how Shindle. how would how would that were like they would try to like consistently like try and one up each other? How would how would they be able to do that? <laughs> Loud has a very di- bigger cakes. The difficult thing is that uh, Henrietta can read like pretty much everybody's brain in the nearby vicinity. So Loud has to just periodically keep killing everyone in the school <laughs> so that she doesn't have a source of information before her birthday party. It's really there won't cute. Be anyone left. It's just to surprise his girlfriend, and if half the students happen to die to make it happen, it's fine. Yeah, the, that's the actual <laughs> birthday surprise, is all of their brain... Like, we know Loud fucking loves a decapitation. He's able to, yeah. like, collect all of those brains and be like, here's your brain birthday cake. I don't know if Henrietta eats brains, but enjoy. Holy fuck. Yum, 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 yum. Anyway. <laughs> yum, yum, yum. I think I have one, but... It's only bare bones, so I ask you to please be kind with this. Of course. So, Henrietta. And, you know, the school. A lot of history with the school. Giant creatures that have lived in the school before. Maybe, you know, maybe underground. You know, what are they doing? I think that, hear me out. Nesca. 
Ooh. Two I badass this is girl be bosses one of them. in the school, different eras, mind you, but you know, like there's they have they could talk about history, they could talk about so much there. And you know, Nesca probably like, from what I understand, like where like everything was with that big like a center area with Henrietta, like bet she would love slithering around all over there, like <laughs> that sounded oh. weird, but you know what I mean? Just like it's like a hamster inside yeah. one of those like like uh, things you can build that can just I run guess. around in. It's like that. <laughs> the tube city type of deal. I could, especially now that Henrietta has the orbs and Nesca fucking loves those oh, orbs. Oh, exactly. Yep. You know, like, the, it's. That's the next four birthdays taken care of. <laughs> why is it, why are you going back to birthdays so much with this one? But like, also, yeah, like, just like Henrietta's whole interest in like, and like the land itself, like literally why she built the school, like everything there, like they have, they can like share knowledge with each other. And I think that would be their way. Plus, like, wasn't Nesco a whole thing, had a whole thing about like sacrificing? Like if Henrietta's bringing in a bunch of just mindless people, oh. Nesco can, can just like sacrifice them. She'll bring in more. Like it, it's a, it's like a, it's like a perfect system. It's like owning your own bakery with like your partner. It's like that kind it's of scary thing. scary system. This is a very scary system. Yeah. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Jeez Louise. This is a very stressful shipping game. <laughs> yeah, stakes are high. But listen, please don't judge me on this. Okay. I think like, no judgment. Way to start it. Yeah, great intro. No, no judgment whatsoever. I think that Merrick the Beardless and decapitated Ferdinand. <laughs> <laughs> was but animated you know like oh okay you know that what just become me wait no death become me what's that movie with meryl streep what death becomes death her beco- <laughs> <laughs> death becomes her where they're just like decapitated and like you know no heads talking to each other mm-hmm. <laughs> imagine a brain a talking brain who's very sad and a Ferdinand who just really wanted to, like, get away. But now she's just, like, a head that can't go anywhere because she doesn't have, like, the rest of her body to move. So I think Ferdinand... Ferdinand also likes to travel a bunch. And Merrick has had, like, no experience whatsoever being trapped underground for, like, m- millions and millions of years. So perhaps, <laughs> like, they it's... can, you know, jump planes together. Plus, Ooh, don't honestly, you remember no. that Merrick does research I on would... different planes so she can actually get or he can actually go to the planes that he studied instead of being betrayed by fucking Henrietta. And then... Quite That's literally. Like, it's funny that you mentioned that. Merrick is the one. I talked with Luke about this. We recorded the Luke section the day before. How dare you? <laughs> Merrick is the one who discovered that gods have their own divine planes. Ooh. And what was Ferdinand Ooh. all about? What was she all about? Interesting. Making her own. Mm. Carla, I think you've stumbled onto something really good here. Not that I'm trying to put a thumb on the scale at all, but just something for everyone to consider as we vote. That's so funny because, like, the show that I also talked about put, like, talked about, like, spells and stuff that gave them infinite life. So I think my answer was perfect. Just saying. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you can't vote for yourself. I know. All right, let me go over your options one more time for both you and the listeners at home. We have been suggesting merrick and artist the uh literally most depressing romantic pairing that you could possibly think of <laughs> sarah with henrietta and loud a truly unhinged but like they would be so dedicated to one another carla we have with merrick and specifically the decapitated ferdinand post decapitation ferdinand that way they can both be floating heads and then sam seeing one giant monster in love with another giant monster and thinking that is beautiful. Dale is old as time. And Nesca. Dale is old as time. We, we you know what, you love it. <laughs> Two girl bosses bound together in love. Go ahead, send in your votes to me, and I will tally them up shortly. Ooh! Hello? <laughs> this time, we have a tie. A tie! Oh, shit! A tie! How is there a tie? Oh, because there's there four, are of, four us. of you. <laughs> <laughs> again, again, again. The seesaw, two people on each side. It's stuck in the middle. 
All right, both of you get a point because the people have spoken. They love the depressed dad combination of Yo. American artists. You know who else they love? They love the severed head combo <laughs> yeah. of oh the Captain Shrednance so and Merrick Beardless. Merrick Beardless, lucky and love this evening as Ben and Carla both receive a point for the battleship's total, which I know all of you at home are keeping up with the scoreboard and you're like, damn, <laughs> I love keeping up with this. I think this is the coolest part of the actual show. <laughs> And the scoreboard has shifted now, bringing oh. Carla up to seven points, tied with Sarah at the top spot. Oh, shit. Ben, one point it's behind on. with six. And Sam, very close with three. We are, <laughs> everything is like neck and neck here. I am loving this. Thanks for sounding nice uh, about we... it, Nathan. I know I'm at like the starting line still. It's <laughs> oh, fine. No. Things are getting spicy. Th three is good. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> it took forever for Carly to get a point, and now she's on a roll. I don't right. like this is everyone's this is what a winner. Sports are all about. Yeah. Uh, everyone's a winner, but we know that in the symposium there can only be one, which is why I will let you all go. As I, I take a moment and I slide into the DMs to talk about it with Luke. Thank you all so much, and I will see you after a short break. Please see ya, everybody. Bye. Bye. Ah, I don't want to die. Bye. 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 Welcome back to Slide Into the DMs. I'm your host, Nathan, and today I am joined by a briny brain, Luke. <laughs> Hi there, it's me, the briny brain, Luke. <laughs> oh, is that the briny brain voice? That's my, if my, <laughs> if my brain was put into a jar of brine, that would absolutely be its voice, yes. No, I think you would have more of a piratey voice because it's like oh. the briny depths of the sea. <laughs> that's a great point. Oh, that's a great point, Nathan. I think What's up? Pi I don't know. I think pirate voices, I just think that there should be more of them in this podcast, frankly, and I just came up with a way to both reference Pirates of the Caribbean and do pirate voices. I cannot wait for the symposium where Bailey Blue takes the stage and says, <laughs> Ah, I sorry I'm late to everybody. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Please ignore me, tentacle stars. <laughs> Drowning really just gave him a different outlook on life, you know? Yeah, hey, first question, what the fuck was up with that, huh? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, think that... Here's Is a Jack off dead? Jackoff just drowned? He's not drowned, but he he was given a boon, you know? And the nature of that boon will reveal itself soon. It's not a boon for him. It's a boon for Bailey and Our Lady of the Deep. It is not a good thing for that grumpy-ass elf. But about the drowning, uh, the drowning at large. So Jakov is off. He got drowned. He, we'll see him, whatever that effect it has later. But with Bailey... There was this assumption that everyone was making that Bailey was already a warlock, which I found quite fascinating, right? Mm. But because I was always intending to show them the moment that he does truly become her warlock, right? And in that moment, like showing this way of him drowning and essentially being reborn, if I can take that from so many different pieces of media or real life religions of like the the die you similar to like what merrick said er, earlier in the episode where it was like in 197 where it was like i i died and my my death has far outlasted my life right like when he died he had this rebirth as a brain right and so we mm -hmm. can see that same thing with like bailey where he has for all intents and purposes the bailey blue who was not a warlock is dead now the bailey blue who is a warlock is the only one who is living right Mm. And drowning is just a fun visual way to do that. And it also fits with just like the the fucking briny nature of like an elder brain. It's just so ominous and intimidating. And, and this thing just grabbing you and drowning you and being like, I was a gift. Now you have powers. It is just a very scary thing. I don't know. I'm scared of drowning. So that's <laughs> that's fair. Like, no, I feel like it is a very intimate way yeah. to kill someone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's also like, in the same way of like this death and rebirth, mm -hmm. you know, the, there is obviously like that, what, you know, that almost amniotic fluid, like yep. imagery of Absolutely. like, you know, 
coming out of that being wet, like eyes hurting for yeah. the first time. I don't know. It's, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of connections much... you can make to it. It's it's just a very, I think just drowning and it being in the water and stuff like that is is very tied to like people's life and death kind of like cycles and stuff like that. So I think Bailey in this moment having his rebirth is, I just really liked it. I really wanted to show that to the players directly uh, as opposed to have it be something that happened off screen right i think that's more Mm. interesting to show it is fascinating to know that this was the beginning of bailey's warlock hood Mm -hmm. just because like before we had i don't know it was one of those things where getting the puzzle pieces in the order that we have gotten them yes it felt very much like ah if he's working with the late with our lady of the deep then the Oblex was also another form of mm-hmm. him working with her. Yes. And I'm like, now I'm questioning whether he mm-hmm. was actually working with her there or if mm-hmm. she tampered with something that he was working on and mm-hmm. he discovered her through mm-hmm. the Oblex being created, you know? Bailey's mentor, who's named in my notes and I can't remember their name right off the top of my head, so I won't say it. Artis Artesian. <laughs> <laughs> Bailey's mentor did receive the Oblex from Our Lady of the Deep. That is the mm. canonical thing that I am supposed that I wanted to draw, and the follow in, ensuing fact that Bailey was the one who then kept the obelix and like nurtured it a little bit and actually tried to make it work and try to like further it right like that's where the connection for him to the Lady of the Woods comes from like her, she's Our Lady of the Deep Our Lady of the Deep Jesus fucking Christ Luke you dumb bitch why would you do this. <laughs> So we can just call her Henrietta. Yeah, let's call her Miss Hedrick. Henrietta Hedrick. So good. It's so I fucking adore that the founders are still here at this school lurking just quietly. Yeah, that's fucked up to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I really don't get wrong. I really like it. And now we're down one, right? Yeah. Is it Merrick? Merrick Beardless is gone. Dead on the floor. Dead. Hey, you know what? I feel like, you know, you got a right to choose once you've been alive for that long. Absolutely. Yeah. I I just love the idea of this very accomplished scholar, this person who founded this great academy, this great school of the arcane, who is like, he died in a peaceful slumber, probably surrounded by loved ones. And then the next moment of his life was not becoming acquainted with a, a deity that he had worshipped his entire life. It was instead it, it just coming back to sentience inside of a giant gilded hall that is like essentially lead lined and you can never leave or see outside of it and you are just trapped in here in perpetuity. This is your purgatory, right? And, yeah. and there's no sign of it ever ending. God, it, just living as a trophy. Yeah. Uh, I think we're like his words specifically. Like a trophy in this gilded hall is just so sad to Mm -hmm. think about like Mm -hmm. truly being objectified for Mm -hmm. centuries on end and so nathan i can actually point back a little bit and show you where i am making a few parallels here if you remember in the hedrick society for excellence the episode i believe 194 there was a set of scholars who were arguing with each other they worked in the same field and they were in school together and they did not see eye to eye it was an eric hawker and a drow weren't they talking about like elementals yes they were and they were arguing with one another and winsler tried to play peacekeeper between them and so i was showing that there's these people here who view themselves even though they're they could be colleagues winsler points this out you could be colleagues you could make yourself each other better Right. I wanted to show that the people who would make it into the Hedrick Society for Excellence, the people who would be most like Henrietta Hedrick, are people who are prone Mm. to seeing people they're collaborating with as their competition, people to be beaten, people to be proven that they are better than. Right. Mm. And so that makes a lot of sense. Yes. So I wanted to show that there. And we have this nice, not quite parallel, but it's along the same lines with Merrick and Henrietta herself. Merrick being kept as just a trophy for her to gloat to and then just leave for hundreds of years to sit and stew with his own mind. Yeah, that's hellish. (laughs) Yes, I agree. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But also something that has come right back after being like hinted at in the 
Hendrix Society for Excellence. Yes. Are the experiments. Yes. And we got to hear just another little, uh, a little morsel of that as well with, what were they? Would, did he say they were experiments on divinity? He was working on, yeah, he was, so I can, I can go into the actual the things because I think that the, this stuff. That would be great. I would love to. I, I didn't want to just out and out say, hey, d- lore dump to no, me, but no also worries. I want to know about the experience. I think it benefits people to know and understand this context. And I don't think it's been very fully a kind of like set in stone. I'm not a, I don't often come out of the woodwork and just tell people how stuff works, which might be a merit and might be a demerit depending on your point of view. In this p- particular context, I think that's important to know who these founders were and what their work exists as now in the modern day. Mm-hmm. Specifically, I can talk about two of them. The other one, Davis Wilburn, I want to leave to the side a little bit more, and I want him to be a bit more clouded in mystery. People might be able to go back and find his name and find his association, but I want to leave that for people to do because I don't want to spell that one out personally. Mm. However, with Merrick and Henrietta. Henrietta started studied the arcane. She was the first person at Wildcliffe that was a piece of information we learned from Merrick. She wrote to Merrick and Davis in turn to come join her at at that time just her workshop probably, right? And mm-hmm. then the three of them f- figured that they needed to start getting more people here. Let's start a wizard's college to so that we can have essentially research assistants and we'll teach them stuff, but they'll help with our stuff, right? Yeah, and what what's also very fun, and like mm-hmm. you've mentioned how you're like the the idea of Wildcliff yes. is wizards and having an apprentice. Yes, uh, like you know that, is, and it's a formalized version of that. But with its beginnings, we actually see a something that would be similar to a witch's coven of oh, yes. three mages who yes. are there to keep each other in check. That's that's this is the thing that you can look at. It is like a witch's coven in that to Merrick and Davis, they came under the impression that we're equals and we're collaborating and we're trying to keep each other on the up and up in turn. And like, we're trying to bolster each other's research together. We are stronger with this magic, right? The way witches uh, as a coven share their power and can grow stronger together and cast greater spells and have greater effect. However, to someone like Henrietta, who is by all means pointed to being very arrogant and self-centered, likely didn't view it as like some sort of collaboration like that she probably viewed it as these two were her apprentices right Mm -hmm. and she brought them here to do her work and 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 even the 18 other students that they first they brought on were people to be lab like test subjects for her like her arcane experiments right so there's like these fun perspectives right so from like the general perspective of what wildcliff was oh it started as a wizard's college blah, 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 and that's what it still is today but from the founders perspectives we can see that there is a more nuanced dynamic going on right that that two of them were quite unaware of right however back to back to back to brass tacks henrietta works in the arcane and her legacy i should say is that kind of arcane theory that we've thrown around so much and then like underlies a lot of like the content of what we understand magic to be like that kind of thing of areas where there's high densities of magic and it flows to low densities of magic and the more spells you cast the more it depletes the magic right and that Mm -hmm. there's this influence from planes beyond our own and that is where this magic comes from and we can just harness small aspects of it right right and i think i explained that years ago in trading places like that's the arcane theory that is something henrietta concocted that is like her legacy here the same way for merrick beardless the man who just died in this uh, 197 his legacy is the concept of like the divine planes and the fact that Uh. each of these gods lives in their own creation and plane and their magic flows between each of those planes and as well as to the material realm right Mm because in his time there was no understanding of where the gods actually were in this planar multiverse right there was no understanding that those planes sometimes just fizzle and connect with our our own right and so the entire divine studies and planar theory kind of sections of wildcliff parts that of the game or parts of the 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 campus and and the 
academic structure and just general like p- world of Wildcliff that we at here at the podcast tap into so often that those are all just like foundation or the foundation of that is like Merrick's influence here and studying the gods themselves, right? And their mm. magic. So that kind of like context I think is important. The fact that these people made these ideas, found these planes, found ways to travel to these planes likely, probably created spells, although I've not perfectly explored that. It's a fun thing in homebrew settings to kind of like think about like who made these spells? Who are these spells yeah. just things that exist or did people make them? And and I think the idea of like Wildcliff being a hotbed of people who have essentially coined spells, right, is like a very fun idea. Although it's one that I've not perfectly explored in my own thoughts. Yeah, instead of, like, Melf's acid arrow, it's mm-hmm. now Henrietta's acid arrow. Yeah. I dig that a lot. Mm-hmm. It's one of those things that I've also, like, thought about. But, like, it's the, the, the difficult thing is, yes. like, if a player can learn yes. it, then, like, how do they learn it without the person who originated teaching it to them, you know? Yeah. There's two problems with that kind of, like, trying to homebrew the spells and who made the spells is you can either keep the names the same and just say, oh, that person exists in this world too, which is kind of not great in my opinion. Or you can be like, oh, these Melf's Minute Meteors, that's Henrietta's Minute Meteors now. And then it kind of is yeah, like- Yeah, and then you lose the alliteration. You lose the alliteration. People, the, the For players, that creates like this weird signal to noise where you're saying like one spell, but that doesn't actually exist as a spell. It's a renamed thing. And, and it's this weird, messy area where- you need the game to be mechanically useful, right? You can't just make up anything. Like, if you make homebrew magic items, you need to tell the players about the homebrew magic items, and they have this understanding that, oh, this is not something that I can just go and find on, like, D&D Beyond or some shit. Yeah. But if you start renaming spells, then it's just a whole can of worms, right? It's, yeah. Then your goal is, like, you should probably just make up a new spell. It's tr- uh, exactly. And attribute it yes. to the new mage. Absolutely. Have you ever done that? Made a new spell? Yeah. I don't know how much homebrew you've ever gotten your hang- your dirty little fingers into. I think the only homebrew spell I've done for this campaign, I don't like homebrew spells a ton. I don't think I'm great at crafting spells. And so I try to minimize the amount that I do that. The only one that I have is the Conjure Memory, which I think I could have used a different actual real spell from the 5e library instead. But I did use I did make up Conjure Memory, which is the spell that Integrity used in the Loft of Elders to see the memories of some of her magic items, her orbs and the wand, and Lee's wand. Which was very cool. And also, then you get the added, like, you know, effect of, no, you have to be in a place that has, what is it? Like, it has to have very very strong magic. That's another thing. That's another reason why I tend to, I think I tend to not really enjoy making spells. Nathan, is because I'm a big fan of, like, softer magic, right? A bit more abstract Mm -hmm. magic as opposed to, like, the spell slot Vancian system. Yeah. Like, I like the idea that people can do things outside of their regular power and it will, like, kill them, right? And that's not really represented very well in Dungeons Mm -hmm. & Dragons. I like the idea that you can only cast a spell in a certain place, right? Like, you can't just use anything anywhere you have to be like you have to be in a forest to cast this spell right you can't just spontaneously create uh like grass out of nowhere for example right like i like those kind of like softer magic things as opposed to like the hard magic system of 5e and dungeons and dragons at large absolutely and i feel like you know when you're dming you're able to give that space to Mm -hmm. npcs a little bit more absolutely yes to like have them access to like other magical effects that may not be available to the player characters Absolutely. just because of you know the different like levels between them i'm i'm sorry i've gotten us way off track <laughs> no worries <laughs> <laughs> i mean you're not entirely off track and we can talk like this is a thing that we can like tie back to the, the the show i'm a big fan of these big magic moments like doing big magic we've had a lot of those moments in the show there's like the conjure memory moment there is the 
artists re- being revived moment where that's kind of like blurring the lines between real spells and then just like this very ritualistic style of bringing someone back from nothingness and transferring their soul around. But you can also point to a lot of like the NPC kind of things such as what's going on with DOS and what DOS did to like re- reverse engineer her memories being all over the place. You can also look at, like, with Bailey being drowned and being given his warlock magic. The the kind of, like, creation of some things has a lot of, like, ambiguity to it. And you can play in that space and be like, it doesn't really say how a warlock becomes a warlock. So I can just say that this really powerful magical thing does this powerful magic on this person. And that's not something that's described by the books. And and so in Mm -hmm. those moments, like, where we can express, like, big magic moments that aren't, like, that are kind of ambiguous. Like, those are moments that I really personally enjoy. I I think, though, in the case of the memories, DOS's memories, it does become frustrating for them, for a player to try to translate that to their toolkit, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, the DOS's memories, like, that whole scene was very intense, and I really enjoyed when, like, she asked Mira... Oh, were you there? And Mira was like, yeah, what are you going to do about it, essentially? Mira just being, like, playing fucking hardball with her instead of, like, batting around. Like, Mira is like, I'm going to stand here and you're going to have to deal with the fact that I'm doing these things. What are you going to fucking do about it? No one at this school does shit and you won't either. It's amazing. It was so good. God, I wonder where all that came from. I can't imagine, uh, (laughs) like, what in Mira's history might, like, lead... (laughs) her to be like wow i can't really trust the authority figures at this school i, I definitely <laughs> can't stuff yeah god <laughs> i do think there's an interesting thing here though where we know dos canonically to be a person who does not really like crow the first time like when crow was becoming headmaster professor dos had applied to be headmaster as head of the conjuration department when he's doing his like intro speech she's like i think i described her as like sighing or rolling her eyes or looking very discontented Uh, she's generally Mm. been a character who's been on the periphery of things who is not a fan of the administration at wildcliff and so is in a very interesting point where she is in charge of the secret society she's the keeper of rituals for the secret society the hse and has to contend with the fact that mira and integrity and bailey know about the secret society which is not allowed and but also doesn't will never go to the higher administration for assistance (laughs) or anything else because she doesn't trust them either and doesn't think they're going to do anything right so i think that like there's just some great like little tidbits there it's fantastic for me personally absolutely god i and also I feel like she likes Winsler enough to not take out anything yeah, on him. Absolutely, yeah. She He's the pride and joy of the Conjuration Department. <laughs> yeah, he's... God, he's the fucking wonder kid. Yeah, absolutely. But, no, I'm, I'm interested to see what kind of retaliation she will take. Mm. And if she will... Because there are still... Mm, God, I my mind is kind of, like, buzzing with yeah. different ways that she can, like, make mira and integrity's lives kind of hell yes and i don't expect bailey to live through the symposium Mm. so like i'm not too worried about what she does to him (laughs) integrity is just gonna burst through the floor and drag him to hell (laughs) absolutely yeah (laughs) it's gonna be rough i don't mean wrong like she's going to go to prison but it's going to be (laughs) worth it (laughs) yeah oh yeah also God, remember the last time when we recorded? It was like, yeah, I think the debate is coming up next. Oh my goodness, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Just fucking kidding. Oi. Oi, oi. Listen, you couldn't have known that everyone would fail their con saves. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think that the fun little tryst, our trio of people in this, this in the divination tower i guess i can say now Mm -hmm. in the halls of the deep in the divination tower i think that that was just a fun it was very fun to put the characters and players into this very alien place where they literally do not know where they are and to see them like figure it out and deal with it like they they immediately were greeted by trenthus who did not treat them as enemies anymore but obviously thought oh you're connected to the network so obviously you're just going to go along with this now right which is this again it's rearing the arrogance of our lady of the deep and everyone who's associated with her that 
everyone obviously just wants to be part of this. As soon as they're part of this, they'll obviously see that this is the best part or that there's no point in even arguing with being a part of this. They'll just go along with us because we are smart and we know what we're doing and we know best, right? It is so fascinating that there is no real like compulsion element, it seems, to the network as a whole. Mm -hmm. It might be like there may be some sort of like compulsion on individuals, but none in the party at the very least. Correct. The debate moderator. Mm, what it was Efrosini. her name. Efrosini. Yeah. Yes. I'm quite interested in what is going on there because it yeah. feels like she got network plus or like. Mm -hmm. She's also a notable for being like there's only a handful of people who were at the HSE meeting who were knocked unconscious and who are now back on campus. Right. Mm. Two of those people or three of those people, I guess, are part of SWIM right mira winsler and integrity and then we also have dos who for some reason was returned to her office she wasn't taken below and we also have efrosini who for some reason is also here and she's acting very strange and disheveled but she's here so something must be off about her right she's a, she's off she's acting very off obviously right uh, obviously but i i'm curious to know if that is like a magical compulsion or if there is a an element in her that is very much leaning towards oh i do kind of want to go along with this mm -hmm. like when when you see how stacked the deck is against you yeah. and then you're given the opportunity to come on the other side yeah i kind of get it yeah absolutely i, I think that's like the assumption that these cranium rat scholars would ha be making because imagine imagine yourself as a little rat who then gets given oh. the immense power of thought by some great and terrible creature in in the bowels of this school and then you're like mm, i could just run off on my own but also this seems like a pre like they're not compelled to follow her it is through the fact that they they truly believe this is the proper way right and so the idea that there's also students who are part of the hse students that are part of the hse who would have the traits that are most similar to henrietta herself right and also have a heightened view or a heightened opinion of Henrietta. Absolutely, right? Because Absolutely. of their placement in that society. It's a lot of layers. Not that many layers, but it's a couple. And I, I, I enjoy each and every one of them. Definitely feels like old Henrietta has been playing the long game in terms of setting up this oh, uh, society. Like, <laughs> yes, yeah. absolutely. Gotta get my pawns all in a row. <laughs> yeah, I think that she is very full of herself. I think that she's a beautiful mix of actual competence and arrogance, right? That That is a dangerous line to be on when mm -hmm. you are competent enough to be, like, fine in just about every situation. Yeah. Then you forget that there are things that you don't know or things that you can't prepare for. Absolutely. Or even you just might see something as that is truly a threat as something that is not even worth your time. Like when Winsler and Integrity start to actually when they left. run and then the rat scholar sees them and then the Lady of the Deep is like, they are literally not important right now. All that is important. The only thing is, that matters is Bailey. Is Bailey's trans transformation. Yep. Yeah. Because at, she's she's so arrogant to believe that just imparting Bailey with a small speck of her power will just solve everything. There's nothing to be worried about. Lord knows that Bailey has also been waiting for anyone to like uh, say that he's the more important thing going yep. on right now. I'm sure that was very <laughs> fulfilling for him. I'm sure like it scratched an itch. Absolutely. But God. Yeah. I... I'm very nervous because I don't know what <laughs> level of warlock he is. Mm, <laughs> and yeah. so uh, uh, it, it, there, there are some messy things you can do with yeah. enough warlock levels. You um, absolutely could. Especially to a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Nathan, I'm sure that those copper circlets or brass circlets that everyone has or some of the crowd has i'm sure that'll keep everyone safe and sound god i i'm really not convinced of that <laughs> at all <laughs> like it was one thing like at first i was like wow i'm really impressed that kurt was able to bang these out so quickly he was able to get 32 done in a matter of hours yeah and then it was like mm, Actually, this may not be good. <laughs> this, yeah. this may be not enough for anyone. Yeah. <sighs> Who knows? Maybe it'll work like an antenna. That would be fun. 
Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh god also i just wanted to like shout out a great moment i don't know if you had planned like the tinfoil hat being something to like block mm. uh, communication or anything like that but great move on like letting windler use fabricate on the paneling on the walls yeah. and everything like that uh in order to create those yeah i if i'm to believe what i was told that was a plot that ben and Carla had hatched because they were like, how the fuck do we keep ourselves from getting like brain blasted by rats? <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> that was not something that I had any clue was going to come up, but it's like one of those fun things of like converging lines of thought where they are, the players are thinking, how do we keep ourselves from being detected by this like psychic presence? And then the psychic presence through me has already had the thought of how do I keep my trophy from ever reaching out and finding anyone else to save them, right? Or help them mm -hmm. at all, right? And how do I keep my warlock, my soon-to-be warlock, from being hunted down by his enemies? Because he has many right now, right? Like that that moment where Mira woke up in the morning and tried to cast locate creature on Bailey. And then I was like, yeah, he's not available. You cannot find him. That is not because mm. he was blocked by anything. That was not because he had submerged in water. That was truly just because of some good old fashioned mind shielding by his wonderful patron. Right. Ah, fascinating. The psychic shields. Yeah. So I, I enjoy that both sides are employing their different uses of lead and psychic shielding <laughs> and metal. It's just this fun, like, psychic fight. It's fantastic, quite frankly. It is. It's so fun. But now that we've gotten, like, the introductory stuff out of the way, we've yeah. gotten, like, the minor things done, I want to talk about the real meat and potatoes of these <laughs> episodes, which is, of course, the election. Mm. Specifically, hey, what are Yogg's priorities as a voter? Uh, now that he's been like roped in by Syndra into her, helping out her campaign, yeah. what is he doing for her? Is he is he like a sensitivity consultant? That's what the, that's the what the, the, that was the, what the implication was. Yes, where Syndra was like, mm. I think that these are great ideas, but we do have a Gollum student now, so I'm going to try to recruit them to aid me. And I still think we see this kind of like everyone, like Bailey and Mira, I think have a very good grasp of what the event planning committee president can and cannot do. And I, I think Sindra that has no idea. Sindra does not have the same conception. The thing that she said to Bailey in the event planning meeting was, you hold a lot of power and I don't think you use it very well. And I don't, I, I maybe that's true, but I don't think Sindra understands what kind of power that is. So sure, sir, Sindra might be able to set up many events and bring people onto campus who are more of the mind that these golems should not be used in this fashion. But I don't think that she gets, it's not like she gets a seat on the council to be like, we should Ugh. stop with the golems. <laughs> she doesn't quite understand the true power of what she's signing up for. Yes, precisely. Like she can accomplish her goals with it. Uh, yeah. But she doesn't understand how. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's just like the Syndra as a character is supposed to be kind of like think or act first, think later. Right. And I think that follows through this. She's not the smartest cookie in the in the pack, you know? No, she her hair is in a bun. That means you're <laughs> smart. <laughs> and, but like it, it's it's this very fun dynamic. I, I, I'm very excited for the symposium. I'm so excited that everyone is it's like this kind of thread of the arc is how far are people willing to go for a small scrap of power right bailey's done all this for a small scrap of warlock power but that warlock power is somehow supposed to make him win the election and the election is for what a year of planning a couple of parties over the like this is nothing right why are you doing all this for nothing my Mira greatest aspiration is to be a middle manager <laughs> and, and mira going through incredibly great lengths is she's just broken into this society meeting breaking into people's dorm rooms doing whatever it takes to beat bailey whatever that means right and and this moment where integrity kind of like backs off and isn't thinking of this from a election standpoint she is thinking integrity idleberry in episode 198 and at the end of episode 197 is not thinking of this as bailey is trying to win the election and fuck over mira and all of us what she is thinking is I, as a warlock, spoke with Keepsy. 
and mm-hmm. Keepsy told me that I should stay on the path of good and righteousness. Integrity knows patrons kill their warlocks. Integrity mm-hmm. knows that this power is something not to be trifled with. Integrity sees Bailey not as a enemy in this moment, but as a person that needs is in dire need of saving, right? Yeah, when when she refused to leave at yeah. first because he needed her help. Yeah. That was that was huge to me. That was yeah. a great character. I moment. I 100% agree. And so Integrity is in that kind of mode. Even though he has her dagger, even though they took her orbs, she she's lost everything essentially mm-hmm. right and still she has this moment of like we need to save him we can still redeem bailey right versus the mira conception and serenup and winsler of he is our enemy he is doing this to kill us to spite us to win this election right this this idea that bailey is the enemy and there is nothing there that needs to be redeemed he needs to be beaten we need to figure out a way to beat him right and, and that's a very interesting dynamic that i hope gets explored more in the episodes to come uh, me too. In fact, I I'm so impatient. Let's go ahead and get right to those episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Luke, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this as much as I did. It was really fun. Uh, and l- dear listener, I hope that you also enjoyed it. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for joining us. And if <sighs> you want to follow us on the Sochmead, Sochmead, you got in- <laughs> Sochmead. You do Soch. Uh, it's. Uh, over on Instagram.com slash Charles and Trebs. Like, checking us out, giving us a follow there is always nice. If you want to find a way to support the show, highly recommend you hop on over to Patreon.com slash Charles and Trebs or visit Trebmerch.com. Mm-hmm. Those are both ways that you can provide some monetary support for the show. Yes. Like, the Patreon support, like, literally goes to help pay our bills mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. keep the lights on, like, pay some of our cast members' rent. And so that is a huge contribution if you can make it there. And if you can't, if you're not in that place financially right now, tell a friend or yes. leave a review on iTunes. Yep. Preferably five stars or your pod- your podcatcher of choice, but we especially love the Apple yep. Podcasts. Absolutely. Also, wait, do we do shout outs to meta- Metallic Dice Games? No, that goes at the we- start of the episode. Damn, I really wanted to talk about how how good my dice from how your dice were. roll <laughs> only crits i mean sarah got a crit with them in this set of episodes yeah they're great like, dice okay we need to do this part because it's a great endorsement they're amazing dice. that's what they i'm trying to say so i good. really yeah no literally and the god the best part is is that they knew when i was rolling them <laughs> and when sarah was rolling them on our during our saturday game yes because they would roll really well for me because they were mine and then whenever sarah would take them she would roll and she would roll really poorly so that's how you know you're getting like a good Freebie even range dice. yes yeah, like it isn't like these dice are weighted to only give you 20s mm-hmm. it's just that they know who they love the most <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know if like are reliable are we liable, Charles, are we liable for that Ted. <laughs> charleston charleston <laughs> yeah check it out highly recommend the liquid core dice those the, them babies are great. I forgot them in Calgary, though, so you all are, have oh, a much better no. chance the next time. Or at least I think we may have forgotten them in Calgary. Goodness. We haven't actually unpacked yet. But okay. regardless, thank you all so much for joining me. Luke, thank yeah, you for joining me. Thanks Dear for listeners, me. I will see you next time <laughs> as we slide into them DMs. Ba-da-ba! Ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba-da-ba! All right.